about one out of every 250 men in the United States will be diagnosed with testicular cancer. And my guest today is not just a survivor, but he is a thriver who is now using a whole food plant-based diet to revolutionize his health and keep his cancer at bay. I met this gentleman in New York when we did the live show up there with Rip Esselstyn, and we just had so much fun. And he came up to me and he said, Chuck, my name is Broccoli Rob. And when you have a name like Broccoli Rob, it's kind of unforgettable. And I definitely wanted to share his story with you today. So with that, we welcome Robert Klein, Broccoli Rob to the show. My friend, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Chuck. It's uh, It's been a long time. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you are here. And first of all, before we even get going on anything, congratulations on kicking cancer, brother, man. I know that that's not always an easy feat to do. So my hat is off to you, man. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Thank you. I'm excited to share my story. Let's get into it, because when you got that diagnosis, you were only 34 years old, which, believe it or not, I believe is right about the average age for when a man will be diagnosed with testicular cancer. Nonetheless, that's still so young. I would imagine that really caught you off guard. It did. Yep. It was it was pretty shocking, uh, I must say. And, uh, you know, I was I, I had a two and a half year old daughter. Um, and basically this came out of nowhere. I, I, I woke up one morning and it basically felt like someone had kicked me in the, you know what, and I had just had immense pain. Um, I knew something was wrong and I basically, we dropped our daughter off at daycare and my wife and I just went directly to the emergency room. Uh, and within an hour that I had a diagnosis. So they, they knew exactly what it was. They said, this is what it is. Um, they did an ultrasound, um, and that was, that was pretty much it. And within 48 hours, I was prepping for surgery. Uh, that's how fast this actually happened. Um, I, I, I got an appointment the next day at Sloan Kettering, uh, in the city, in New York city. Um, and I, I live in New York, so I, I, you know, we're close to that hospital. And I, I mean, that was, that was it. And I just, I wanted it out as, as quickly and uh, as easily as possible. And so. How advanced was the cancer when they found it? Uh, that's a good question. So they, the, the first surgery I had was uh, orchiectomy. Uh, so that was to remove the, the testicle that had the cancer in it. And that was a pretty minor surgery. It basically was similar to, um, having a hernia surgery. So they make a little very, very small incision in your groin area and they just literally just pull out um, the testicle. Um, they, they weren't able to stage it from that surgery. Um, so the plan was from once you have, once you take that out, you're basically doing blood tests every, every week or two for a few months um, to, uh, make sure that the tumor markers in your blood are actually going down. And so that was what happened. Um, once the tumor markers normalized, um, to basically zero, um, they then suggested that I have a, another surgery, um, which was, uh, it's called a RPLMD retro peritoneal, um, dissection something. Um, and so that, that's the surgery that allows them to stage the cancer and, and basically remove all of the lymph nodes that it could have possibly spread to. Um, and so that was, and it really, it, it, it wasn't optional surgery. So, you know, it's, it could, I, I could, I could have decided just not to do it and then just wait and just basically just see what happens. Um, but they encouraged me to get it done just for peace of mind. And so I opted to do that. And, and that surgery was a very invasive surgery. Um, you know, I, I was, I was out of work for about three months. Um, you know, cause they cut your entire abdomen from your sternum. So I have a scar right from, from stern, from your sternum, right on your chest, all the way down around your belly button all the way down to your groin area. And they, 
basically remove your, they take your, your intestines out of your body. They place them on, on the operating table and then they go to your, the back, your, the back of your abdomen cavity and they remove all of the lymph nodes and then they test those. And so that is, uh, and it was like hundreds of lymph nodes that they removed. Uh, and so thankfully when they tested all of that, they, they had said it had not spread. They didn't see any signs of cancer there, which means it was stage one a, I believe. Um, and so I did not need chemo. Uh, and that was what they wanted to, to see if, if they had seen other, some other cancer anywhere else, the next step would have been chemo. That sounds terribly invasive. Um, I mean, what are the long-term risks associated with that? I mean, you, you, you literally just talked about having them take your intestines out of your body, putting them on the operating table, and then removing, you said, like 100, 100 or so lymph nodes. I mean, what, what are the long-term risks, potential complications that the doctors told you about? So there were compli there were there weren't complications, thank God. Um, but the risks were um, so scar tissue. So there's there's some scarring because they handle the intestines. There's some scar tissue that that develops, uh, and so for a certain amount of time, I was not able to eat uh, nuts, seeds, popcorn, uh, carbonated water, anything that would like sort of disrupt the intestine area where it, it just, it took, it took a while to get back to normal. Um, it, I, I could not have any fat whatsoever. So like zero, zero fat in my diet for about two months afterwards. Um, and that was actually really, really difficult. Um, I mean, it was, it, I, I, I got to a point where I was like crying for food that had fat in it because mm. The, the, you know, the body, as we know, the, the body does need fat, it doesn't need a lot, but it does need some fat. Um, and so that, that was rough. Um, the fact that they, they cut my, basically my abs, my core, my entire core was, was the muscles were sliced. So I had to rehab that. I, I, I it was hard to get out of the bed, um, for a while. And, you know, it was basically, I, they basically said, walk, walk as much as you can. Yeah. I remember. So when I had, uh, my w weight loss surgery, they actually, it wasn't done laparoscopically. They actually opened up, uh, my abdominal wall as well. And I always found that to be the most painful part of the entire yeah. procedure. It's like, people don't realize just how engaged your core is and literally every movement that you do. And yeah. so I remember waking up from that surgery and just feeling like I had been hit by a truck and, um, I just, honestly, Rob, you know, I, I don't ever feel like my abs quite got back to what they once were, man. But I'm hoping that with your level of activity, because you, you turned into quite the runner, um, perhaps your story might be a little bit different than mine turned out to be. How, how long did it take to rehab that entire area? Do you feel like you're pretty well, uh, pretty well back to normal there? Yes. Um, I, am, I am, and I was just talking to my wife about 10 minutes before before I got on here, I am in a hundred percent, the best shape of my entire life today. I am in the best shape of my life. Um, and it, it started from, from that bed. Um, when I was in the hospital, uh, I told my wife, I am going to do the New York city marathon. Uh, as soon as I got out of here, I'm getting, I'm doing New York city marathon. And so that was in 2017. Um, so we're going on six years. Uh, almost seven it's coming up on seven in April. And I am actually running the New York city marathon. Today is Friday. I am running the New York city marathon on Sunday, this coming Sunday. I am finally running that race. <laughs> okay. Hold on. So there's no way that this interview is actually going to be released before the marathon, but I'm just curious. Cause here we are about 48 hours from the, the, the big race. How are you feeling, man? Are you nervous? You excited? Like that, that's a long distance to be running brother. Uh, very excited. Uh, it's basically a victory lap. I mean, it's, this is, I've, uh, I'm an Ironman. So I, I've, I've done a bunch of Ironman races. Um, three 70.3s, which is a half Ironman. I did a full Ironman uh, last July in Lake Placid. 
So that's 2.4 mile swim, uh, and then a 60 mile bike ride. And then after that, a full, full Ironman, um, marathon, which is 20, 26.2, uh, miles running. So this is just the standalone marathon, which is 26.2 miles, um, through New York city, which is where I grew up. It's basically a 26.2 mile block party, uh, where you're running for a couple hours with tens of thousands of, of people cheering for you. So it's going to be fun. <laughs> and no doubt, man, no doubt. Uh, what do you think it's going to be like when you cross the finish line that day? Um, I think I, it'll probably be emotional and there'll, there, there'll be some, some tears maybe holding, holding back. Um, but it's, it's going to be a good day. No doubt about it. Um, I want to turn back to your cancer diagnosis here. Um, in doing research for the interview, I was looking at, you know, what are some typical causes of testicular cancer? And there were a number of different things listed on there. Um, didn't necessarily see diet, though, among them, unlike a lot of other cancers that we talk about here on the show. When you think back at what may have caused this to pop up for you, what does your mind gravitate toward? Uh, it's a good question, and and it, it's it's really impossible to know for sure. Um, but there is a couple of there are a couple of theories that I have. So one theory is um, when my grandmother was trying to get pregnant with my mom and my aunt, she was taking um, some some medication that has since been been shown to cause birth defects and and issues in the sexual reproduction organs of of um, their offspring so it, it's possible it, it, it came from that i know my mother had issues actually holding uh, getting pregnant and so i'm an only child um and so that's one possibility um the second possibility that really came into my mind is when i was in high school i worked at um, uh, a photo developing, uh, place like at, at the drugstore at Genevieve's. And so I developed photos, um, and I handled all of those chemicals and I probably wasn't as careful as I should have been with all the gloves and all that stuff. So I don't know. I mean, it, th those are really the only two things that, that, that popped into my mind. <laughs> yeah, I got you. How, what about other cancers in your family? Does cancer tend to run in your family? Do you think that there could be some other sort of genetic component happening there? Uh, it's certainly possible. Um, so my grandmother, that same grandmother on my mother's side, um, had breast cancer. Um, and we're also sort of, she blamed it on that, that medication that she took because she had a lot of friends that actually had it also that were taking that medication. And um, she had a radical mastectomy and caught it early. And thank thankfully, she lived. My, my mother was, I think, nine or 10 years old when this happened. So and she lived to a ripe old age of 84. So and she was about 40 when 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 she was diagnosed. My my grandfather on my on my father's side, um, unfortunately, passed away from multiple myeloma uh, in the mid eighties when I was about two or three years old. So I don't even remember him that, that much. Um, so, I mean, there is a history of cancer, but that's pretty standard for, you know, just the standard, I can't want to say standard American diet, but it's just a standard American health situation that we're in. <laughs> very, very much. So I think that virtually everybody who's listening right now might be able to relate, or at the very least, they know families like yours, uh, like mine, who have just, um, a lot of people have been touched by that big C word there. Um, nonetheless, though, I mean, 34 is still such a, a young age. I know not necessarily so much for testicular cancer, but that probably was like the last thing that was on your mind that was going to happen to you that day when you woke up that morning. Yeah. And, and they actually said that it's unusual that, that I hadn't had any symptoms prior to, to that. Um, a lot of times there's, there's something. And actually they also said that um, a lot of times you don't even feel it. There's not like a pain in that pain that comes with it. It's just like a, a tumor that feels like a pee on, on, on it. Um, but 
somehow it, it manifested itself that way. And I was able to, to catch it uh, relatively early. Thank, thank God. Absolutely. I think that that, you know, probably um, if things would have played out a little bit differently when they took a look at your lymph nodes, it, it may have been a different situation if you didn't get this addressed so quickly. Um, so in that regard, my man, I'm, I'm really happy for you that things shook out the way that they did. I also, Rob, think that you, having such a traumatic event like that occur with your health would take you a moment you you would take stock of where you truly were in terms of how you've been living what you've been eating are you taking good enough care of yourself did you have that moment where you really did kind of take stock of where you were at that point i did and what was the I assessment actually, I, well um i i i can credit my parents actually to introducing me to the china study and and they didn't even really know what it was they were just looking for for anything right because their only son had just been diagnosed with cancer and they're like we got to do something right you got to do something to take to, to take charge or of your health and not just allow this to happen so uh while i was home in between the two surgeries that i had so i i, I was diagnosed in april of 2017 i had surgery at the end of april i didn't have the second surgery that second big surgery until june and so, and I was on leave. I was, I was home. I was able to take full paid leave from my job. And I, I was home from April until September of that year. Um, the month of May. So it's May of 2017. And, and that's going to be the month that really changed my life for, for, for the good. But it, it, I was never the same after, after I was home. Um, so I looked at everything. I looked at all types of diets, um, keto, you know, every, all the fad diets, um, there's, I even looked at, so there is something called the Gershon cancer therapy. So it's like a non-toxic cancer therapy. Um, a lot of it has, is involved with nutrition and food, but there's also like, they have like special type of coffee enemas and other things that are supposed to be natural and, and to help help cancer. So I was looking at that. That's actually how I started um, looking into nutrition. Um, I, I had hired a health coach that was specifically aligned with the Gershon technique. And she is the one who told me to stop eating animal products. Um, now, I read the entire China study book from cover to cover. Uh, and I am a data person. Uh, you know, I have a science background. I'm a computer scientist. And... I, as soon as I read in the China study that Dr. Campbell was able to literally reverse cancer, turn it on and off by simply removing and adding the casein protein, which is dairy, basically. So I, at that point, I immediately stopped eating dairy. So I was like two weeks into cancer and I stopped eating dairy um, and chicken and meat and all that stuff. I stopped eating all of it. Um, and that is how it started. That is, that is really how it started. And it went down a very, very long, long convoluted, convoluted rabbit hole until I got get, until I'm talking to you, Chuck, six and a half years later. So, oh, what a rabbit hole, man. We're, we're going to cover those six years. Don't you worry. Yeah. Um, but dairy, right before I went plant-based, that was like one of the last things that I gave up. And I was drinking well over a half a gallon of milk a day. I just loved it. Were you hooked on uh, dairy as well? Were you a dairy junkie? How much were you taking in? Um, I think mo most people don't even realize how much dairy they're actually taking in. So even if someone says, oh, I'm, I'm going to stop eating dairy, like, okay, I'll stop, I'll stop drinking milk and maybe I won't have cheese. But if you eat anything that comes out of a box, almost anything, like 99.8% of, of processed food that comes out of a box has some type form of dairy in it. Um, now, a lot of, there's a lot of vegan products now, just in the last maybe two years that they're, they're marketing because there's, there's an audience for it now, but you know, back then, anything that came out of a box has dairy in it. Mm. 
Yeah, that, <laughs> it really does, man. It's it's it can be tricky, um, especially as you're just getting going and you're trying to navigate these whole food plant based waters and trying to figure out how do you do this. Right, um, and there's so many. There's just so many names for it as well. Oh yeah, you, have, you just have to know what you're looking for. You know, it's a it's a steep learning curve, uh, and 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 that is for most people. And I and I run uh, 21 day jump starts with Plant Power in Metro New York, so I'm I'm a mentor for for these. These people that are trying to take take charge of their health, and they're 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 doing this. They're they're making this change for 21 days, um, and we you know we guide them through it uh, on how to go food shopping and what how to cook, um, what to look for on the labels, how to read the labels, how to read the labels with the, the amount of sodium, the the percentage of sodium that you have with the one to one relationship, and um, there's just there's a lot. It, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot. Um, it's hard to take and you have to go one step at a time. Um, but in terms of the dairy, um, I agree with you, Chuck, that is probably the hardest thing to get rid of. Um, oh, the yeah. easiest thing for me was meat. Uh, and, and I was a steak eater. I mean, I loved steak. I loved the good steak. I would, you know, on my birthday every year for 15 years, probably on my birthday, I was at Peter Luger's or one of the, one of the expensive steak houses in the city. And we went out for steak every, every every year. Um, but surprisingly, that was easy to get rid of that. The chicken, the beef, very easy. I have no cravings for that whatsoever. You know, and I wish I could say that your story is unique, but I think a lot of people find it to be very similar in that regard. I do not miss meat to this day. I have absolutely lost my taste for it, although it is kind of funny to hear the name Peter Luger's. I haven't even thought about that place in forever. Um, but yeah, meat was so easy to give up compared to the dairy. The dairy is is what I craved, yep. man. Um, and, it's, and it's still, it's still, I still have issues with the pizza. You know, oh, sure. The smell of a, of a good pizza. Oh, dude. And you're living you in can. New York. Forget about it, man. Forget about yeah. it. You know, <laughs> the New York, I'm sorry, every other city, but New York is the pizza capital of the world, hands down. And you'll yep. never convince me otherwise. Um, you mentioned when you would uh, you were home recovering in that first month, you were looking at all different kinds of diets. And you mentioned like you couldn't eat fat for so long, and yet you were looking at the keto diet as one of the possibilities. That must have been torturous for you because that is a notoriously high fat diet that in in those days at least you were in no position to even attempt to eat, right? No, there was no way. There was no way I could even do it. And actually, it's probably it was a blessing that I was I wasn't able to eat the fat because I didn't even try it. And I I, I got far enough along with Dr. Campbell and and then Dr. Barnard and and you know Dr. Greger, all everyone that at that at, at I was I was convinced by the hard data and the science that this this is the way to go. Uh, and the best part about it is, as long as you're eating the right foods. You can eat as much as you want and stay the same weight. And your weight will eventually just equalize to what your body is supposed to be. Uh, it might take a couple of years if, you're, if you've been eating the standard American diet. But, I mean, I eat ad, ad libitum to the, as much as I want. And I, I work out a lot. I exercise. And I eat a lot. And, you know, that's, I just eat a lot of – it's high carb, low fat. That's what it is. It's a lot of potatoes. It's a lot of grains. Um, it's a lot of delicious sauces that you make, um, oh, with, but, you know, but you're not counting calories though. It doesn't sound no. like, nope, not at yeah. all. Just eat until you're full and that's it. And when you're hungry again, eat some more, call it good. Um, I like that, man. And I find, I find that especially for people who have lost weight, myself included to keep it off. That is a sweet, sweet thing to have in your pocket to know that you're not on one of those diets where you only have a certain allotment of calories that you can eat in a day and you you know they've concocted this system where you can blow them all on one indulgence and still be okay but then what the heck are you going to eat the rest of the day you're starving so suddenly that slice of cake that was okay just isn't worth it anymore so i love this idea of just eat until you're full and then you're good to go and it is, it's a different kind of full, right? I mean, eating what you eat today versus when you went to your birthday dinners at the steakhouse and you walked out and you probably felt a lot different after eating that meal than you do even on the most plant-based of Thanksgiving dinners. Right, right. It's a, it's a very different kind of full. Um, I mean, and I think 
most people don't realize how it, most people have never experienced the type of full that does not come with inflammation and with lethargy and just basically that how how every american just thinks they're going to feel after thanksgiving on thanksgiving yeah. afternoon and yeah. they just it, it's like they want to feel like that but i don't know if they want to but they they want to experience the joy of eating all their favorite foods and then they just accept that they're going to feel like garbage for the next three days basically so let me ask you this you gravitate eventually toward a whole food plant-based diet after a health scare um nonetheless i mean that's still such a radical shift in the way that the average person eats how did your family react to your decision to go down the plant-based rabbit hole so it, it it took a while. Uh, it definitely took some some time. Um, I was actually I remember when the the day I decided I wasn't going to eat any meat specifically, and uh, and I was afraid to tell my wife. Um, and I actually I didn't tell my wife, and she had made these turkey the, her famous you know the turkey meatballs with the sweet and sour sauce that I we always love, and she made it, and and I had it on over pasta, and I was just like picking at the pasta and trying not to eat the meat. And she said, what are you doing? And so I, I, I mean, I told her, I said, I'm, I, I was reading this book and I, I think I'm going to try, you know, going, not eating meat. And then, so she's like, she was actually on board with that. She was, she was happy. She's like, why didn't you tell me? I'm like, well, cause you ate, you made the food and I didn't want you to feel bad, but she had been a uh, vegetarian on and off uh, in college. And then even when I met her, she was trying it. Um, I, I made fun of her a little bit for it at some point. Um, but that's, this was vegetarian. So she had, she had dabbled in, in vegetarianism. Um, so she, decided, she said, okay, she'll be vegetarian. Um, and so she was vegetarian for... Um, she watched me go from vegetarian and then to vegan and then to no oil whole food plant she she watched me go the full gamut over about i mean i i became more strict over the course of like maybe a year and a half to two years after that and even when i started like really being a, a, a triathlete when i was training um that was when i really got into it in 2019 early 2019. um so it took about I'm trying to think of when she it was after the pandemic that she went full on so she went full in 2021 so the summer of 2021 so it, it it took about three years of her watching me do this for her to fully become on board and was it was it hard for you being the only one who was fully on board in the house uh it wasn't easy per se um because the, the reason why I ask is there are a lot of people who I hear from, a lot of the exam roomies are like, I'm the only one. I'm the only one in my house. And sometimes even my my spouse will, you know, give me a hard time about it. So yeah. I'm just curious, like, what kind of advice you might be able to offer someone who's in that position? So I learned how to cook. <laughs> um, I, I went to um, online cooking school at Ruby. I, I took the uh, the plant based uh, cooking course with them, and then I went a step further and and, be, and took the professional plant based cooking course with them, um, and then I went even further than that and became a. I'm just now finishing up becoming a food for life instructor um, with PCRM. So, but but really is if the only way to succeed at this is to make your own food and know what what's going into it, uh, and so most of the time I. I I would make food and and my wife and daughter would eat it um they the only thing that really they they did not cut out completely was dairy and and everything else we were eating the same or like processed food and you know snack food and stuff like that but it's and and that's what that what the dairy that's where the dairy came from and sometimes pizza you know it's <laughs> pizza is is very very especially as a as a kid right i mean my daughter's going to birthday parties um and she's still she says she's vegan, right? And then when she goes to a birthday party, she's like, I'm going to take, I'm not vegan for two hours. I'm having a slice of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and like, well, she's nine and she, she, she understands. She, she's pretty good. She's pretty, 
she eats very, very health, healthy, and she always goes for the, the veggies and the fruit first. Um, and I basically, you just crowd out all the other stuff. And if you have a little bit of it, it is, it is what it is. Yeah, you're not the only parent who I've heard takes that approach and, and says something to that effect. Because um, you can only control what you can control. Um, and those are, you know, within the walls of your home by and large. Right. Um, but you always have those open conversations with the kid and arm them with that education so that, you know, they can make their own informed decision when those times uh, do come. And they certainly do. So, um yeah, you're you're certainly not the only parents to be to be doing it that way. And um yeah. And in New York, man, again with the pizza, that's that's a hard one. By the way, are there any like what are the top notch vegan pizza places in New York? I would imagine there have to be some that are just there, amazing. There so I mean you can you can go to any pizza place in New York and and order a pizza vegan. Um because I don't eat the vegan cheese because it has it has all the coconut oil and stuff that I don't I don't want to eat. Um, I basically order a, a, a pie with extra sauce and every veggie that they have. That's how I order it. I say, give me every vegetable that you have and pineapple and extra sauce on a oh. large pie, and then I eat until I'm full. And it's usually four or five slices. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like now we have to talk about this debate of pineapple being a bona fide pizza topping. This is about as divisive as politics. You are either pro pineapple or you are anti pineapple and say it has no business on top of this particular pie. <laughs> I am a pro pineapple guy and have been even long before I was eating a plant-based diet. I will argue to the death that yep. pineapple is a fantastic pizza topping. And as a matter of fact, you can give me the cheeseless pizza with pineapple and pineapple only, and I'm going to be good to go. Why? Because pineapple is delicious and don't you ever forget it, my friends. And that's all I have to say about that, Rob. Agreed. A hundred percent agreed. <laughs> we we've ordered pizza with just pineapple and mushroom and sauce. That we've done that before. Yo, pineapple mushroom. And then I like to throw on chopped olives. They usually don't have that, but I do it myself. And my wife doesn't like olives, so we can't like order it like that. But olives on pizza are just, are just unbelievable. You get the, a little bit of the saltiness. You get the fat from it. It's delicious. From... And if you put it with pineapple, then you get the salt and the and the sweet. I was just going to say, it's like, you've just created a flavor explosion, man. That's why people like the Hawaiian pizza. You know, if, if they're not vegan, they like the ham right. and pineapple. Cause there's, there's your sweet, it's your salt fat. and your fat, man. So yep. you're hitting the trifecta, but right, you do right. it at plant-based. You replace the ham with the olives, broccoli, Rob for the win, <laughs> dude, you have blown some minds right now, Rob, man. Well done. And if um, you put some cashew cheese on there, that's, that's for extra credit. If you want to make some cashew cheese. But that depends if you're eating nuts or not. But I mean, you you basically just throw in uh, a cup of of, of cashews um, with with water and lemon juice um, and garlic, a fresh garlic cloves, and you just blend that up. It becomes a creamy ricotta, basically. You just throw that, you just dribble it right onto the onto the pizza. Delicious. You can make baked ziti with that too. Rob. I'm wow. actually making that tonight, so I'm I'm loading up. I'm car I'm load I'm carb loading, carb all loading. tonight. But hold on, do you really even need to carb load as many carbs as you're eating these days? I mean, isn't it a little bit different? It is. It's definitely different. I don't need to. You're you're absolutely right, Chuck. I do not need to. Um, but Delicious. I, I you know people. I want people to well. I want to fit in. Let's say that. I want. I want. I want to. Say, I'm eating my pasta. It's whole wheat pasta, but I'm eating it, and I'm eating a lot of it. With, That's all good, man. With the, the the you know the cashew cheese and the sauce and the garlic. Would you go so far as to maybe do olives and pineapple in pasta? Like I almost think that that could win. It sounds weird, but the flavor profile I think is there. You know, I've never tried that. That is a good idea. I think I might try that tonight. Yeah. Again, weird. You're going to have to get over the strangeness of it, but I do think that there's going to be a payoff at that finish line yeah. for sure. And I'll sure. throw some hot sauce on there too for, for good measure. Rob, <laughs> next level, Rob. Next level, buddy. 
you and me, simpatico when it comes to that stuff. I love where your mind is at. Um, question for you here. When did you decide uh, that it was time to get up, lace, uh, lace up the old sneakers and start going for runs and not just runs around the block, but friggin' ultra marathons, Ironmans, the New York City Marathon. When did you get into being super fit, man? So I, I, when I was in the hospital, I, like I told you, I, I told my wife, I'm going to, I'm going to do this marathon and the, the rehab was, so I had to, while I was even in the hospital, I was in the hospital for about five, six days. And I, they had me walking around the, the floor, basically. It was, it was like a loop and I was pushing my IV cart and I was walking. Um, and they said, walk as much as you can. And then in order to leave the hospital, I had to walk up a flight of stairs, which was very painful. Um, and I had like two PT guys like holding me up and we were walking and, and then I finally got to the top and they said, you can go home. Um, but I started walking. That, that's, that's the point. And while I was recovering that entire summer, all I was doing was walking. I got a Fitbit. I was counting my steps. I was, I was competing with my friends. My, I was doing like, you know, 20,000 steps a day, um, walking, just walking. Uh, and then I just started running. From there, it started. It started. I just never stopped. Basically, uh, I went back to work that fall, uh, and then I said, "Okay, I am going to." I said to myself, "The New York City Marathon—that's a the twenty-six mile run. That that sounds hard. Why don't I?" And I always had a thing for triathlon. I used to watch it as a kid, and I'm like, "Why don't I try a, a short triathlon instead?" Because that's only a sprint triathlon that's a half a mile swim and then it's a it's a 12 mile bike ride 12 or 15 mile bike ride depending on the race and then it's only a 5k which is three miles i can walk three miles i've been walking 10 miles a day i can walk three miles if i had to at the end if i was tired so and again my parents so my my dad actually found me a coach he, he knew someone from the gym that he was working out and that, he, that was a coach that was a triathlete. And so he, he gave me his number. I called him up. This was in April of 20, 2018. I said, I just had cancer a year ago. My doctors cleared me. I want to do a sprint triathlon. I'm, 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 I'm looking at a sprint triathlon in July. This is April. Can you get me there? He's like, okay. So I hired him and, and, I've been with him ever since. And I basically went from that sprint in July. I fell in love with triathlon at that day. Uh, I immediately signed up that same day for an Olympic distance, which is double the sprint. Uh, and I did that in that, that September in uh, Westchester, New York. So I, so that the Olympic distance is um, it's a, it's a half a mile swim or it's like 0.7 mile swim. And then it's a 30 mile bike ride. And then it's a 10 K at the end of that, which is about six miles. Uh, so I did that race and then I was like, really like, okay. So then he said, you're going to qualify in order to qualify for New York city. And I, I told him this was my goal. I wanted to run the New York city marathon. Uh, you need to run nine New York Roadrunner races in New York the year before. And then you have to uh, volunteer for another one. They call it the nine plus one program. And so, I started doing that. So I, I basically started running all of these races, uh, in, just in order to, to get the, uh, to basically be able to register for the New York city marathon in 2020 to have the privilege of paying for guaranteed entry into New York city marathon. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but I think that, um, I think that the payoff's going to come for you. And, and when you cross that finish line, it's going to be an emotional thing, man. And uh, I, I do wish you all the best of luck with that race. And the last question that I have for you here is number, well, actually two. Uh, number one, where do things stand with your cancer today? Are you still getting screened? Are they still looking at your blood? What What's going on there? So uh, I am cancer free. Um, Good deal. I don't know if they They've never actually said the word remission. I, I don't, I've never even asked them that. Uh, but 
it, it basically, I was one, six years ago, I was going once a month. So basically once a month I would get, um, blood work done and then they would do a chest x-ray because, uh, sometimes if, in, if it comes back, it would, it sometimes manifests itself in the lung. Um, so they do a chest x-ray. So they were, they were doing that once a month for a year. And then the second year they were doing it every two months. And then the third year, every three months and so on and so forth. And so at this point I'm doing it once a year. And so once a year in the summer, I just go for my blood work and my chest x-ray and that's it. That's what it is. And I, I just asked them this year, I said, when do I stop doing this? And they actually said, uh, you do it for the rest of your life because it's, it's, it, it actually, it's, it's possible that it comes back. So, and again, the way I'm eating, I don't think it's, I have the very confident is not coming back. But. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, absolutely. Fingers crossed for you there, man. I, you're certainly taking all the right steps and taking quite a few steps, man. We're, we're talking marathons and 20,000 steps a day walking like you, you're a step guy for sure. Um, yeah. And just curious, like on your blood work, have you been able also, since you made this transition to the whole food plant-based diet, have you been able to look at other things like your cholesterol, uh, maybe even blood pressure, things like that? That's not necessarily blood work, but you know, your other biomarkers, have you noticed a difference? Yes, definitely. Um, it was, I mean, my, my cholesterol is probably 180, maybe close to 200 at some point when I, before I was eating like this, and now it's like 140. 130 sometimes depends depends on the year but uh it's it's in the it's in the healthy range um heart is is great uh blood pressure is decent um yeah we're good so you're feeling good man you're feeling good you're looking good you're out there running your patootie off dude uh you know i'm just i'm just so thrilled to have had this time for you and uh you know, what's the last thing is, you know, what advice might you have for somebody who is in their late twenties, early thirties, or maybe, you know, even a little bit older, but you're a guy and you think mm, something's just not quite right down there. What would your message be to that person? Get it checked out immediately. It doesn't hurt to just ask the doctor. Um, a lot of times it's nothing. And most of the time it probably is. Um, it's a, it's a relatively rare form of cancer. So but it's it's better to check than than to let it grow because that's the worst thing that'll happen well my friend you are a shining example of how it should be done how it could be done and just what the end result could be because i think that you have come out of this whole ordeal healthier than you have ever been in your entire life as you said so thank you so much for sharing your story with us and thank you for everything that you're doing with plant powered metro new york and welcome my friend to the food for life team as well dude you are going to be a rock star of an instructor man i'm so glad that you're a part of the team great thanks chuck it's a pleasure If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.